Hi, this is Doug Schnitzbana. I want to welcome you to the weekly chat. I am the editor of the new uh, weekly magazine for Outdoor Retailer. And every week we feature a Q&A session with some experts uh, in all sorts of fields in the outdoor industry. And then on Thursday, we sit down here and talk to them live or try to talk to them live if our, uh, if our web issue, if we don't have any web issues. Um, and today, really excited to have with me uh, Kelly Ramirez from Prismatic and Brian Hennessy from Talkout. And we are going to be talking about the building blocks of digital success, uh, how you can be successful at online retail. And they're going to hopefully leave you with a handful of actions you can take right now to kickstart growth in your own digital channel. It's a big responsibility on them. Uh, <laughs> first, before we do all that, we'll go through a little slides about how this all works, if you haven't done been to one of these before. Um, first thing is, if you're having any trouble receiving audio during the broadcast, you can select the question mark icon in the upper corner of the webcast interface and then select test my system now. And you can always disconnect and rejoin if you're experiencing issues. Uh, we actually had a few little issues while we were starting here. So if one of us disappears for a little while, we will add a little bit from there and hopefully you will stick around with us. Um, next, questions. Questions are a really big part of this. And if you have a question, you can submit it in the box labeled, ask a question. Uh, the questions are sent directly to the moderator and they're not shown publicly. So you don't have to be afraid of asking anything. Your name won't be given out. Um, and all questions are good questions. And as I said before, we really like to get to as many questions as we can during the show. Try to answer all your questions. It's not always possible, but we'll do our best for that. And finally, this is being recorded. And you can access the on-demand file on Outdoor Retailer's website. Uh, it'll be available about 15 minutes after we conclude. All that said, let's get down to business. Uh, Kelly Ramirez is the founder and CEO at Prismatic. She launched, launched Prismatic after nearly a decade at Google, where she led the global growth initiatives for the top 1% of digital native travel advisors uh, including Expedia, Orbitz, Travelocity, Hotels.com, et cetera. Uh, she has a hyper-focus on the foundational elements that enable a company to succeed in the new e-commerce system at Prismatic. She's an advisor, interpreter, and hands-on practitioner for brands in growth mode. Brian Hennessy is the CEO and co-founder of Talkoot, the world's first agile product, uh, agile product storytelling <laughs> application built for direct-to-consumer brands. Uh, prior to Taku, Brian was the global writing director at Adidas, and then went, went on to found Thread, a story studio that helps great companies find and tell better stories. And as we were kind of saying before these two came on, they uh, both approach digital commerce from two different directions. Uh, Kelly's sort of more data-driven, and Brian's sort of more story-driven, but we'll get into that a bit more as we uh, as we get into this. Um, so maybe let's launch with the first... Did you have something to say? Let's launch with the first question um, that we had when we did the Q&A with you guys in the magazine, which was, uh, why is e-commerce intimidating and how do you demystify it? Which is obviously a huge question. Uh, Kelly, why don't we start with you on that one? Why is yeah. e-commerce e uh, intimidating to so many people? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that just the history of e-com and the fact that there were at, at the beginning of the onset of the industry, a lot of really large players that were well known at owning big parts of, of the puzzle pieces. Um, I think, that, you know, those being Amazon, Google, Facebook, um, there also is a lot of jargon that can be associated with e-commerce and with digital marketing and analytics in particular. So um, I think for a lot of folks that didn't grow up in the digital realm, it feels like learning a different language. Um, and so that in itself, I think is intimidating. Um, what I know that Brian and I are super passionate about is um, from each of our own perspectives is breaking it down into these building blocks. So um, I'll, I'll mention the building blocks that we sort of a approach them by both of us, even though we take a different uh, a different tack on it from our businesses. Um, one is building a foundation for, for digital and for e-com, um, really putting um, the building blocks into place. The second one is turning up the human. So making sure that as you think about e-commerce, 
Um, you are always thinking about it as this really dynamic way to engage with the humans that are on the other side of your brand. And the third one being um, small is actually better than big. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in the conversation, but um, to your question, Doug, about why it's intimidating, I think because it, um, when you take it as a whole, just like a lot of things that you're learning new, um, there, there's uncertainty. And so um, the reason that it shouldn't be in intimidating or the way we can break it down is really approach it in those three ways, break it down into those component parts. And remember that digital is this new, um, you know, high demand way to interact with customers that love you or that want to love you. Um, and so it can be very human. And I, I would say another another reason it's intimidating is because the media puts such a huge kind of so much hype around these you know unicorn brands and these founders from Ivy League schools and whatnot. But if you look at actually the, the, the reality, there's a whole bunch of normal people doing really well, founding great brands, and all these, these unicorn founders, you know, were former art students and former you know marketing professionals. They weren't. Um, the people that you you know you build them up to be and the media build them up to be. I think that there's a, you just have to dive in, just like my parents dived in and learned how to program a VCR. Technology can seem challenging, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you just have to dive in and start. And you know, do you think that sometimes uh, people feel like part of the intimidation is that you're just a small voice in the wilderness? You know, as you said, it's dominated by so many big brands, right? Is that one one part that would make me feel intimidated if I wanted to launch? I think that's absolutely true. It's, I think it's true that it's something that's intimidating, but I also feel that it's one of those um, uh, false false narratives. Um, what I, what you see is all these. You know, it's the same uh, thing that people said before. Like, you know, it took me ten years to be an overnight success. When you look at these brands, it is just focusing and doing the right thing, doing what feels right to you, um, and slowly building that community around you that, that is paying attention. And those, those people go tell the next group of people and the next group of people, and pretty soon those two um, followers turn into 20,000. And Brian, wasn't there an example, a specific example you had, I can't remember now, but in the story we did in the, the magazine, who kind of started very small and is now huge. Yeah, one of my favorite examples is Emily Weiss from Glossier. You know, she's on the cover exactly. of Time Magazine last year. And every time you look at kind of like where she's at, you see these pictures of this, you know, this these meticulously taken photos of her dressed really well. And, you know, she's at the helm of a billion-dollar company. And so it, it can seem quite intimidating. But as Kelly and I were talking about when we gave a talk at an uh, outdoor retailer in, in winter, you know, she started out as a scared 28-year-old former art student. By her own quote, she's like, I'm not an MBA. I'm a, a former art student. And she just started. And that's the, I mean, the beautiful thing about digital in general, even me going from marketing to start a software company, is you just start. And you start making mistakes. And the beautiful thing about digital is that you can change it at any time. You make a mistake, you do it better next time. You do it better next time. It's kind of the whole agile mentality is you just start where you are and get going and you'll figure it out as you go. And Kelly, I guess adding on to that, I mean, so you don't need to be, I mean, you have a background at Google, uh, yeah. you know, you know, the analytics know the numbers really well, but people shouldn't be intimidated by that either, that they don't need to be an SEO expert or a, a math genius to do this, right? No, you definitely don't have to. I think that, what um, I've seen, even as observing, you know, companies that we work with, because we, we work um, very closely with companies that have traction in their product, but they might not be digital experts and so need some fuel there. Um, but really, there are so many great resources. Um, and Doug, if we have a chance to share some of those in association with this webcast, um, I'd be happy to do that. But, you know, I think a solid understanding of things like Google Analytics, for example, and really at the end of the day, it is about one, um, having a very clear understanding of your customer and understanding how you can see that behavior through digital. And then, um, you know, something that we talked about at the winter show was, um, was continuing to surround yourself with people who, um, who can then help in those specialty areas. So, 
Um, you know, the Emily Weiss example from Glossier, I think is a perfect one. Is she a programmer? No. Does she have people that she eventually added to the team? Yes, of course. Um, but that's not how that, that company and not the heart of that company started. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I think um, the, the inclination to, to shy away or to think, gosh, this is a big thing to tackle. Um, as Brian mentioned already, it, it's these small pieces um, and it, it isn't gonna happen overnight, but you, you, it does make sense to get started. And so some of those tools would be, you know, making sure that as a leader, you're having conversations with your team about what, what are we seeing on the website? What are we seeing in the e-commerce environment? What are our customers responding to? Um, where is their friction? And those are a lot of like, like questions that we coach our, our partners on, um, and they eventually become very confident in asking those questions. So I think that that's a great place to start is ensuring that you as a leader of your company and then the people that um, are on your team or responsible for e-commerce are able to really talk to those to those metrics and be comfortable in, in ultimately relating it to the most important thing, which was um, how are your customers experiencing these, uh, these platforms or the situations that you're putting them in. Great. Well, we got a question. Maybe I'll throw that to you guys now and before we move to our big questions. But uh, okay. and somebody's asking if you are new to e-commerce, how should some, how should some distinguish how should we distinguish between someone who is selling information versus online business profit systems? Hmm. Selling information. <laughs> um, I mean, I know that there are definitely business models where you give away what you what people think are the product, you give it away for free, and you sell the information, your customers' information. Um, and then there's the, you know, you're actually selling products. And when it comes to e-commerce and especially the, you know, outdoor industry, I haven't seen too many models where you're giving away something, you know, a product for free or media for free and then selling um, your customers' information. I think with with outdoor, it is much more about kind of direct to consumer and selling, having that relationship with your consumer, a uh, transparent relationship with your consumer, where you're selling them products that, that really matter to them and uh, solve a problem in their life rather than selling information. So I don't see much of it. I mean, I know it exists, um, but. To be honest, my and probably Kelly's area of expertise is more of a um, direct-to-consumer model or an e-commerce model where you're not selling your customers' data. Sure. I actually don't necessarily believe in that. Great. Um, you, you have anything to add to that, Kelly? Or... No, I think that was... Perfect, yeah. Well, let's uh, then start with you for the next uh, question I have for both of you guys. We, we talked about... Uh, Finding the human within within uh, online uh, e-commerce, uh, what would be the first step you think someone could take to try to demystify this process? Yeah. yeah. So, in terms of finding the human, and um, I think one great way to to do that, um, even as a team, is to take some time and to really walk through what your customer journey is on your website. Um, you know, think about the channels that they're coming in on. So often that would be they're coming in through paid media channels, they're coming in through an organic Google search, or perhaps through a social link if you share things on Instagram or Facebook, for example. And then, um, you know, really put yourself in the shoes of that potential consumer that you'd love to attract as a customer and really map out cleanly what are they experiencing when they come to your homepage? Do you have a very clear value proposition? Um, is it clear what action they should do next? How are your category pages organized? Um, and then what happens when you send them to a product page? Um, is it very clear what their action should be in adding a product to the cart? Are there a lot of things that are being presented to them that might confuse that behavior? Um, so I think you know, first step as a brand is really putting yourself in the shoes of a consumer and thinking about it, not unlike a specialty retailer um, or a specialty retail experience that they might have walking in your front door. Um, so, you know, I think the other thing that allows, especially outdoor companies to stand apart um, and just knowing the passion that exists in this industry is, are you putting front and center your ability to answer their question, to solve their problem um, with the product that you want to connect them with? And um, that could be things like, you know, live chat that you might be using on your site. 
um, and really just thinking about the ways that you're you're getting in front of them, or most importantly, you're connecting with them. To um, and in our work, we often talk about removing friction. So, what are you doing in that digital environment that um, makes it feel, you know, as close as to to them navigating your in-person store? Great. And Brian, Brian, would you? What's your from your angle, what's the first step to finding human to demystify in this process? Yeah, um, I mean, not I'll, I'll kind of uh, agree with Kelly, um, but I'll take it another tack at it because we do that thing. Um, you know, in regular retail, it's all about location, location, location. Like if you have a prime location, people are going to walk by your store and they're gonna walk in. On the web, there is no location. So what I would say the replacement for direct to consumer and for e-commerce is point of view, point of view, point of view. Like what is your point of view? Don't treat your company like you're selling things like a store. Think about it like a magazine and a magazine has a point of view. Like fast company is, you know, move fast and break things. Whereas the economist is like move slow and do a deep dive into things. Um, cigar aficionado is not a cigar. A, a, a magazine about cigars. It's about mag, uh, a cigar magazine about power and status. And these direct consumer brands who are taking off right now, it's the same thing. Like Airbnb is a travel company about belonging. Chinola is a, an accessory company about rebuilding American manufacturing. And they like our Glossier. Glossier is a skincare company about inclusion. So like, what is it? You're an outdoor company, but what are you an outdoor company about? What do you build products about? And that's how people find you because they that resonates. You know, they'll be clipping, clicking through social media or looking through, you know, some online blog, and they'll hear this this point of view that resonates with them. So that's the first thing is when it comes to human, like we all have these, you know, invisible beliefs that drive all our behavior. And I buy from certain brands because they resonate with my beliefs. You have to figure out what your beliefs are and just always talk about that belief, just like a magazine. Mm -hmm. I like and it. I'm, I I'm ready to put this gig and, and start into e-commerce. <laughs> you you I'll, I'll add one more thing to what we both just said because I know that people are here too to get some tactical tips on what they could do yeah. today. Um, so there is, you know, what is really common in brands that are um, that are doing well in e-commerce is being able to truly see into that user experience. Um, and so for those that are participating today and you're interested in like, well, what does that, what does that look like? What could I actually do? Um, some of the suite of tools that I would recommend would be, um, there's a platform called Hotjar that offers a very basic um, intro level plan. And what you can do is actually place those pixels on your site and you can begin to see things like click maps and heat maps. Um, that's a great starter tool that allows you to see what people are actually doing in this environment that you've constructed for them. So it's just as if you're having them walk through your front door and one of your salespeople is observing that they keep getting stuck at like some end cap and they can't get around it. Um, so that would be one tool um, that I would suggest. You know, There's a, a number of them out there, but I like Hotjar because it offers a good free option for those that are just getting started. Um, so I definitely suggest looking at some of those and considering those, putting those on your site so you can start to understand what's happening with real people in real time. I like it. I wrote it down. <laughs> so okay. Good. You'll have to tell um, me what you think. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we do have uh, uh, some listener questions coming in now too, and I think they're pretty specific, so we can hop on with some of those. Um, and the first one's very specific. It's, it is, once you build your site, what are, what is the best way to drive traffic? Love That's like, that question. Oh my gosh, Brian, can I do it first? Can I answer this oh, yeah. one first? Um, okay. I'm ready so, to <laughs> um, so um, this is a myth. This is this is a good myth busting opportunity. So I think that definitely the best way to start driving traffic for any brand new business is to build your organic following. Um, we are, you know, once brands have traction and you can understand the return on the investment that you might make through paid media campaigns, those can be a great way to drive traffic. But in order to do that, you've got to be pretty certain about your target audience. Um, and we always make sure that we've got a number of things set up before we advocate for really investing in paid. 
The exception to that might be, you know, wanting to start some early tests. But I would say in terms of, um, and, and I'm going to answer the question how I heard it, which is brand new brand. So you like put the site up, you're ready to get started. What do you do now? I think you've got to find your audience. You have to find that niche and those people that you can directly speak to your community. Where are they? What do they care about? What are their problems? How can you answer them? How are you solving them? Um, and then begin to think about um, the ways to to get in front of those people and 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 bring them into your site. And then, um, you know, from a data perspective, whatever channels them, those might be. So let's say it's organic social. Let's say maybe even you decide to partner with a group that you know has the audience ear of those that you want to connect with. When you use links to share with them, you always want to um, be, be sure that you're tracking those with tracking parameters so you can understand what's working and what's not. Um, so that those that would be my my answer. Definitely starting with that organic demand, people you know should have a reason to love you or a reason to want to engage with you, and then find where they are um, and connect with them through um, networks that might already be established. And then um, I know paid is is a popular answer, but really I would say um, we see the success of paid advertising come into play when you know you have some traction or you know where your audience is and you're willing to start investing there and measuring that investment. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Brian, would you add to that? Um, yes, exactly. That would be exactly my uh, response is you have to work on that organic traffic. Most of the direct to consumer companies that are going off right now started with build the community first and then sell the community something. Don't sell first and try and build a community. Start by building a community about that point of view, about having creating content about not just your products, not talking about your products, but your worldview. Like what is it? Why is it we're connecting? Why are why are we selling this range of products? Um, you know, it could be like, for instance, one thing that I don't see out there right now is, and I might be wrong, someone might, you know, someone here might point out that there is one, but I've never seen a retailer that sells um, uh, sustainable uh, outdoor products. Like I've seen there, there are companies who are working on sustainable products, but I've never seen an outdoor uh, a retailer say, okay, I only, we only sell sustainable products and here's our guideline for like what we view as sustainable. All of a sudden, you're about something else. You're about not just selling things. You're about sustainability. And then you can write a whole bunch of articles and content and draw your community through content about what you're about. And so that's that's kind of build the community first and then monetize. Uh, not monetize, that sounds terrible. But basically, like build a community, and then they'll want to buy things from you versus trying to sell things to people. Yeah, I like it. And I have to tell you that 10 years ago, I did try to build a Sustainability is going on sustainable. So I like that. I like that idea a lot. Um, so, you know, talking on the same level, uh, looking at knowing who this organic community is, I mean, maybe taking an example that we talked about before with like Glossier, who do you, who was their, you know, organic community they started with that made them so big? Or maybe is there an outdoor brand too who you really can think of who really nailed that organic community who they grew out of? As an example, yeah. Thanks for bringing up Glossier because they are um, the poster child. Is um, Emily started a blog into the gloss long before she founded Glossier? So she just went. She interviewed kind of um, uh, in influential and inspiring women. It didn't have to do. They weren't associated with beauty. It could be um, journalists. It could be photographers. Whatever. She just said, "Okay, what's in your what's in your." Um, in your bathroom what do you use what's your skin routine whatever and she would just kind of show that these women aren't necessarily perfect in terms of like what the beauty industry would say is perfect not models but they're beautiful in their complete selves and we want to know what they do and so she built this following that really believed in this kind of broader sense of beauty and this inclusive sense of beauty and she brought she built this huge audience, and then she started to build products about that kind of inclusive sense of beauty. Um, mm -hmm. Huckberry, in terms of outdoor, Huckberry is another good example of, um, they knew, she, I would say, uh, Glossier, didn't, she didn't have Glossier in mind when she started her blog, but Huckberry knew that they wanted to turn into kind of a catalog for um, urban and outdoor men and so they created a whole bunch of content, grew their audience, and then started selling. 
And the other thing I think that Brian is in both of these examples um, that is very relevant and especially right now is, you know, it is not, I think the myth that we together from our different perspectives always want to debunk is it's not an overnight flip on the switch success and you're making $10 million, right? There's going to be learnings along the way. And then the brands that are most successful are very intentional about staying true to their core, their core purpose and their core why. Um, and I and I think that this, you know, in no other time has maybe been as um, visible as as the this bumpy road that we've been traveling with the onset of, of COVID in particular with stay at home orders and really, um, you know, just the shift um, in our in our everyday lives. And then watching the brands that have either been able to really um, soar and thrive in that time. You know, I won't even say survive because we have multiple examples of, of brands that have just done incredibly well. But I would say the ones that have done incredibly well have been very committed to staying true to their why, to their message, and to their community. Um, that, you know, they really, in some instances, pulled back on the sell, sell, sell message, but really were answering problems that their community or their target customer or their consumers were having. Um, and then allowing them a path forward. Um, one example, you know, a company that I think just does a fabulous job, Mir, M-I-I-R. Um, mm -hmm. We watch them just have, have really great success around a special limited time offer print um, on a mug that they did because it did really move communities that, that they were connected to. Um, and they were doing it um, with an intention to make, to make a difference, to make an impact. And I think that consumers to do see we, our BS radar, I think as I, I said in the article is, is very sensitive, right? And I think more and more so um, people can tell the difference between what is true and authentic and what is fabricated. Um, and so uh, back to the original statement, like being able to build that organically, having your community around it, and then continually being there, not getting distracted by other things. Um, allows companies to survive even some of the most challenging times and and then digital to connect with customers that they might not otherwise be able to see in person, especially right now. Absolutely. And I think what I, I get out of what both you're saying is too, and you have to be a part of this organic community you're trying to speak to. You can't just show up and say, hey, I want to make some money. Who's yeah. that? Who's the I can speak to yeah. come from who you are. Yeah. Yes, hundred percent, Doug. And I think, um, you know, it's not about like popping up a t-shirt shop on a corner that you all of a sudden notice is busy. It's like the companies that will, that will continue to do well, we are noticing more and more, you know, are coming from that, that core why or solving that problem that they had um, and then building on that and really truly making meaningful connections and also standing behind their product. Um, and I think that that has, that has driven some incredible success, especially when, and here's where the digital part comes in that you know that I love, you can partner that with the channels that you need to connect with the people that will want to love your product. Because um, you know, with the advent of the internet in the 90s and early 2000s, we realized that you didn't have to be, like Brian said, it wasn't about location on a street corner or an intersection. Um, and now even more so to be able to get in front of the audiences that want to know about you or need to know about you digital is what you have to do. That, those are the channels that you have to use. Sure. Um, well, let's, let's look at some of these other questions here too. I think we have a lot of questions on, on those real specific things that we wanted to get into, actually action people can take. Uh, yeah. The next person wants to know, if you had to weigh options for potential vendors for e-commerce integrations, such mm. as tax, uh, point of sale, et cetera, do you have any potential gotchas or pitfalls to look out for that might put one vendor ahead of another? Oh, that's a great question. Can you cut out just a bit, Doug? Could you repeat that so I can make sure yeah. I catch it all? If you had to weigh options for potential vendors for e-commerce integrations, such as tax, shipping, point of sale, et cetera, do you have any potential gotchas or pitfalls to look out for that might put one vendor ahead of another? Yes. Um, so I, we are actually working um, through a, a something like this. Um, so I do have something that immediately comes to mind, and I, I see this over and over again. I would say if you have the opportunity to look at a bunch of different vendors, um, really one of the most important things is that you have the ability to have what we call an open API, 
or the functionality to pull and push data freely between different platforms. So that is my number one. If you can have that functionality or that functionality is available, that means that you aren't beholden to using a system that that vendor might create to get your data in and out. Um, and from, from a growth perspective, data and clean, visible data is your most powerful tool to make the best decision possible. So that that is my gotcha. Um, and that's always the first question I ask as we're coaching our clients and partners through integrations is um, that, that question about an open API and being able to push and pull data freely between your different marketing platforms, maybe between, as this person said, their POS, um, their inventory management platform. So yes, uh, that would be my answer. Did you have something to add on that part? I have a, a point of view on that as well, and it's it's really similar. And it's about the open API. Um, so Butterfield, who's the founder of Slack, um, there, there's always a concern. People, uh, brands talk about like, oh, so many tools, like not another tool, not another tool. That's not like someone who's building a 80 story apartment building saying, oh, not another hammer, not another tool. Like, there's lots of tools to build a huge, uh, a big, uh, uh, building, there's lots of tools to build an e-commerce site and it's not like it's complicated, but what I would say is don't look for the big, you know, one size fits all through the line um, solution that solves everything. Look for lots of different solutions that are really light, really focused on certain aspects and that they have, and what you want to do is have lots of different tools that, that pull data and share data and you can change one out. If it's not working anymore, pull that one out, put a new one in in and have a much more flexible um, kind of IT structure versus some huge one, you know, one size fits all system that is going to solve all your problems. I, I would say that waiting for that one system to be the thing that solves everything is we've seen so many brands. I mean, especially with COVID, we saw so many potential customers and, and brands say, you know what, we're waiting, we're going to, we, we We've announced our digital transformation, but we're going to wait until we find that one system. And then COVID mm -hmm. hit, and they're they're screwed. Right, frankly, no, that's, they weren't flexible. That's a great point. And you might find, you know, too, um, as teams evolve. So I find in our work, we might start with a, a nimble team. The, um, maybe it's a, a marketing team of four or five, and maybe one of those people is focused on e-com, as this part of the business grows and begins to be more successful, you then bring on more specialized people to be part of your, your marketing team or your e-com team. And those people might have you know, preferences with tools or perhaps they have um, you know, code knowledge, something that you didn't have on your team before. So I love that point of, of a flexible system of picking you know, a stable, like the most important thing is going to be your e-com platform. And then, um, and then you can plug things in around that. But if you're talking to a vendor that says, no, absolutely, you have to use only these things with our system, eh, 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 that's like a huge red flag. So, um, so that flexibility to adapt is huge. Uh, we, we had someone just wanted to know, they wanted you to clarify whether that was hot, hot jar, right? Not pot jar. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, H O T. Yes, H O T. Yeah, and there's a number of platforms on the market. Others might use other tools, but their their free tool to try it out um, has a, a lot of great functionality. Cool. All right. Another question here is, uh, what suggestions do you have for companies who recognize the potential of e-commerce but still mostly rely on sales reps for brick and mortar sales? How do we get mm -hmm. sales reps on board? How can online sales actually support business without alienating sales reps and retail partners? Great question. That's a that great is a great question. question. That, is, that is a question that most brands have. Um, the answer is that direct consumer, having a strong direct consumer um, uh, website is going to support your wholesale as well. And there are brands, in the end, what's going, what's going to happen, there always seems to be this kind of false, I guess that kind of false dichotomy of like, it's either wholesale or direct to consumer. But really, if you do direct consumer right, your wholesale will see a rise also because customers have this one source of truth. They can go, they're shopping 
shopping in store at one of your retailers and they can go to your direct consumer site and read up and go they're like, ah, okay, that's what this product is about. I really love this. It can, it can, it can be used as, as a selling tool. There's also um, a company, I'll put a plug in right now, I, I own no stock or anything, but locally um, is this is a uh, company where you can order from, say, Patagonia online and pick up your local retailer. So I think that what's happening now is there's this wonderful integration that's happening between retail and brands where it's mutually beneficial for, for everybody. Yeah. And I would um, add to that and go a little bit deeper on the organizational side of a business, because while that is 100% true, what, what Brian said, and we definitely see that in the numbers, um, as as I have conversations with business leaders and those that are also trying to move their brands through digital transformation, um, it is you know sometimes that the incentive structure doesn't allow for you to be flexible between that traditional sales wholesale model and the direct to consumer model. Um, so this is a perfect time to be that bold leader um, and look at some examples of other companies who have done it um, and know that you are going to have to change that structure and it might be painful at first, um, but you can also. Um, you know, think about ways that that you could align those individuals in your company a little bit better from the from that more established structure where sales reps are comped in a certain way to a more flexible structure where the full team is pulling in the same direction. And with every company that we have worked with through digital transformation, they have those conversations, and they they have to re. There, there's elements that you do have to restructure and rethink, um, and it does take. You know, changes within the organization to really align teams to pull in one direction versus to see it as my team versus yours or our, you know, the traditional way we've done it versus this unknown way we've done it. It is up to the leadership of that company to see what's happening in the marketplace and reorient their teams to all pull in the same direction. Great point. Yeah, yeah when, when Rich Hill was working at Amazon, he told me that, that, that there's uh you know that there's a brick and mortar consumer and there's a digital consumer and you just have to worry about you know not trying to change those consumers into different people but worrying about you know who they are do you uh do you see things on those lines too that those consumers are not going to cross over too much you'll still get people who are just going to want to go into brick and mortar and you'll still get people who are never going to go into a store right and you can you can reach all angles maybe if you spread out your e-commerce and your brick and mortar yeah, I, I actually don't agree with that statement, um, the way that I'm hearing it, in that I think, you know, more and more, the fluidity and flexibility between brick and mortar and, and digital is, is changing. Um, you know, over the COVID time period in particular, just for Q1 of 2020, globally, we saw an increase of 40% year over year of unique digital shoppers. So these are people that never were on digital before, and then they are present because they had to be, right? Um, I think that what, what, what is happening from my perspective and what I'm observing is that the, the purpose of brick and mortar and of those physical stores serve something very different than that one-time purchase. That is the place where you can create community where you can be very um, visible and um, you know direct about that point of view that Brian mentioned, um, and I you know this is an example that's used a lot in the outdoor industry, but I think Evo is a great example of this new model that yeah. they don't have to do one or the other, and in fact they started with digital, they built that community, um, and then they're doing all kinds of cool things that are offline and brick and mortar, and their their brick and mortar stores do great. So mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think it is a little bit different than that and that um, uh, with the current climate and even more into the future, it's going to blend more than it has in the past. But I, I think that also gives a great opportunity on that earlier point I made to like, as you, within your brand, within your company, to be pulling in the same direction of growth and advancement and innovation, regardless of who owns that um, you know, last handshake with the customer that brought the dollar in the door. Fantastic. Um, we have a couple of people who wanted to let let us know that there were there's a uh, there is a sustainable all sustainable shop outsider in Brack, um, and Meyer Skis was letting us know too that they're a sustainable eco friendly brand. Um, so there oh, definitely are. are out there. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of sustainable uh, uh, eco friendly brands. That's great, but it was the 
retailer is, is that I've actually been hunting for them so I could use them as an example. But so that's great. I'm glad I have one. Yeah, outsider and Breck. Yeah. Um, and someone else wanted to let us know too that uh, Outdoor Voices is a good example uh, to speak uh, for community first, which I'd mm. absolutely. Yeah, and I also think when you were talking about that too, I also thought of you know Outdoor Afro with Rue Map, where she also just started with a blog and and found that seam of a, a community that wasn't being spoken to and now has a major national network, not not e-commerce, obviously, but. And that's the that's the the big point is who's not being spoken to. It's that's the thing that you have to find is there's communities within outdoor. So outdoor used to be a niche within kind of sport and lifestyle, but outdoor has become kind of a really huge community. But there are people on the outside of outdoor who aren't being kind of spoken to, and are people inside who are like, I like going to the outdoors, but why do I have to wear things like this? Why do I have to? be this person to go outdoors. I mean, snowboarding is a perfect example. Snowboarders, like skaters, were in the city and kept out of the mountains because skiing was such kind of an elitist thing back in the day. You know, you, you were the lawyer who took their family skiing at the lodge, and you felt very alienated. Snowboarding came along, you know, with burden and whatnot, and they said, hey, hey, you can come in. It doesn't matter. You don't have to kind of buy into this kind of luxury culture. And that was a that was kind of speaking to somebody outside of the industry who really wanted not even industry outside of the uh, culture who wanted to be invited in. Yeah, and it gives us a good chance to be more inclusive too. If we expand the idea of what outdoors is, we've been very limited in thinking it can only be a certain amount of brands that look a certain amount of way, um, and that leaves out vast swaths of people who want to be outside and just don't connect with brands that they might not see in that's where all the, that's where all the growth is going to come from is recognizing there's a whole bunch of people left out of the community um who want to be in the community but they we just we don't model them. we don't look like we don't speak the way they speak we don't talk to them the way they want to be talked to and we don't have the products they want to wear or use What do you think on that, Kelly? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, back to that point of, of I think there is a lot of opportunity, especially not outdoor, um, to allow those voices to be heard and to lead that that opportunity to open to open that and like model for it. Um, because to you know, we went through this period in the market where there was you know like greenwashing or pink washing. Um, right. And so I think yeah. you know, there is, rather than doing that, to be able to, to make that space for people to, to step in and, and create those opportunities and still be under the umbrella of outdoor is going to be just really, really important. Um, so yeah, and I think, I think especially e-commerce is a great way and digital is a great avenue for that to happen because you can connect with a lot of other people um, that might share your viewpoint or might feel that same viewpoint that you do or be looking for the same opportunity that you are, and it doesn't mean that you have to live on the same block. Um, that is, while there's some downfalls to the internet, right? I think that was one of the things, if we all remember like back in the early 90s when there were chat rooms and you were meeting people and connecting with people that you just never even right. knew existed. I think we have like another wave of that happening um, and we're seeing that in a lot of different ways. And so I think that that's incredibly exciting and it gives you as a small business owner, a medium business owner, an entrepreneur, a way to find those people and connect with them around something that you feel really passionate about or a problem that you're solving. Like it. We're getting back to a few questions here. Uh, someone saying, Brian mentioned having an agile mindset and Kelly mentioned being comfortable with key e-commerce metrics. What are the most important e-commerce metrics and how can we use those to enable an agile mindset? Love that question. Um, okay. So I have, Five. <laughs> we have five KPIs that we always use and we um, make sure our, our clients and partners are really comfortable with them and we're constantly reviewing them and, and referring back to them. So those five most important metrics on e-commerce, um, and this is from the perspective of looking at your e-commerce website. Um, those are sessions, transactions or conversions, Average order value, average order value. Uh, well, so I'll explain them. So sessions, that's the number of people that are coming to your website. 
You're actually tracking those as visits to your site. Um, transactions, that's your conversion event. So let's say you're selling a product. I want to sell this can of LaCroix. And when somebody buys us off my website, that's a conversion. I count that as one transaction. Average order value, that's the, the average amount of your sale price of your basket size. Conversion rate, um, that is the rate at which somebody is buying when they come to your site. Um, and then, um, also, we'll use the, those four. I think we can start there. And those are the most important things to understand by overall and by channel. So then you can understand what, which channels are performing better, which aren't. Um, some of the more advanced metrics that we use um, are things like cost per acquisition. So how much did it cost for you to get a customer to your site to buy? And ROAS, that's a return on ad spend. Return on ad spend is how many dollars does it cost you um, to, to make, so how much are you paying to make the return on your marketing dollars? And so with, with those, those metrics, those are the ones that we're constantly referring to, we're asking about, and we're using as both a baseline and a comparison. So the, like the scientific part about this is you're always looking for, you're finding opportunities and comparing what's working versus what you already understand, like a control and an experiment. So once you have a really solid grip of those KPIs or those metrics on your website, you can then have conversations with your team and also look at yourself, what's working better than something else? And then the goal is do more of what's working better. Um, and that's back to this idea of like, you're constantly experimenting, constantly learning. There's gonna be things that don't work. Maybe you do a partnership or you decide to do um, you know, a, a paid marketing campaign and it totally flops and it sucks and <laughs> you're bummed about it, but you know, because you're looking at your metrics that that's the case and you don't have to go back and repeat that again. You can move towards what's working best against those metrics that we talked about. So driving traffic, seeing what that traffic is on your site and then understanding what the return is for the money that you spend on that initiative. That's what I was going to ask Kelly, because I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask my own question. What about customer <laughs> What about customer acquisition cost? Is that uh, a, a big part of what you measure? Yeah, so that's that CPA, that's our, our, our bonus. So once we've got our, our standard KPIs, our standard metrics down, then we can start to think about um, how much it costs to, to attract that customer into the site. Um, and that comes into play when you're using paid marketing levers. Love it. You guys are still there, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, and that's why. You, is that good? You guys, that's, why organic, that's why organic traffic is so important because organic traffic, you don't have to pay for that traffic. You have to that's, pay for it in blood, sweat, and tears and words. <laughs> but yes, you're not, you're not that, that ROA. And this is where, too, I think that's a great point, Brian. Um, as brands move into this growth area where they're actually ready to make investment to acquire customers and needing to manage budgets that range, you know, anywhere from 5,000 to 100,000 to a million dollars a month that you might be spending in outbound ads. Um, it's really, really important you know your measurement of success before you start to do that. So to that earlier question of the best way to start to generate traffic for a brand new brand, um, we never recommend that a brand start heavily investing um, until they can really understand the success or the failure of those dollars, um, which will allow them to make better decisions along the way. And, and along those lines, someone wants to know, uh, besides organic, can we purchase targeted audience lists or industry-related mm -hmm. leads? Do you really prefer building the community and organic versus purchase lists or retail lists? Hmm, I think it depends on where those purchase lists come from and how qualified they are. Um, you know, another alternative that I've seen as be successful um, versus like a straight buy would be creating a cohort of like non-competitive brands um, and sharing lists that way. Um, you of course have to make sure that you, you know, you share the same, you have the same audience goals and they're relatively equitable, but that is a tactic that I have seen work to build that organic um, community because you're finding people that 
you know, share a lot of the same things that you might be solving for, or they share an audience that you want to go after. Um, and so if it's mutually beneficial, that partnering up can work really well. And I think everybody has probably noticed a lot of that happening in the last 18 months to two years. Yeah. You can think of it as in terms of phases of growth. You know, at first you have to cross the chasm and that's where the organic, you have to make sure your audience or your, your message resonates and your content resonates and you're actually gathering people not through paid, but they're actually wanting to connect. They're wanting to sign up for your newsletter. Um, once you get that kind of core group and you're like, ah, okay, I actually understand this customer now. I actually could tell you who this person is and why they buy and don't buy. Then you can go into kind of scale mode and then you can buy lists and start to scale that and go out and look for the next cohort of those kinds of customers. Whereas if you start by buying lists, you just, you have no sense of who you're talking to or, or what they want or care about. Going back to agile, it's still that it's that agile approach. Sure. You know, here's a here's a good question. I think may, maybe we've gotten to it, but maybe we'll reinforce it. Someone wants to know if you see the you know we're talking about e-commerce, but they want to know if you see the same strategies and tactics that you're advising for e-commerce applicable within community-based organizations building a base for social involvement. And they say to Kelly's point, finding the human. How can you use that to motivate? Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, I love that. So I'll, I'll share one example. Prior to getting involved in digital and analytics, um, I actually started my career in the conservation world. And I worked as a project manager for a national conservation organization. And I'm still involved with them, passionate about the work that they do. But I find that, um, that in conservation in particular, we always have a really hard time just breaking down what the point is. There's a lot of you know, even letters that come from conservation organizations that are nonprofits, you'll see they're two or three pages long of text trying to get to that point of connecting somebody to a landscape that they're trying to preserve or conserve or ask for a donation. Um, and I think that storytelling element and really understanding the human behind the message um, allows you to make progress, whatever you're doing, whether it's selling a product on e or building, you know, the, the, cohorts that you want to be involved in, a social movement that you truly care about, that you think is going to make a difference. Um, it is, it's about really figuring out how to move people, um, regardless of what that end like, conversion point is in our language, but is it a purchase? Is it an action? Uh, I think all of these things that we're talking about are applicable to community organizations, to nonprofits, um, to, to all sort of gathering of people that we're trying to move in one direction or another. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, works for the World Wildlife Federation, and we had a long conversation about how what we do is so similar, and it's, it's like doing the same thing in two different worlds. All the tactics, not all, but there's so much overlap. And I do think, look for this, I think that the outdoor industry, it, you know, is incredibly well positioned, to, to, and we've seen examples of brands doing this, um, but I think we can do more um, in really, you know, rallying this passion for the places that we love and the things that we love to do and aligning that behind, you know, actual um, change that we know needs to happen or we want to see. And yeah. so I think the tactics that you've seen and, you know, this is a well-worn example, but the things that Patagonia has been able to do um, by rallying around a product, but they've really found their community that identifies with their product. And then also saying, hey, if you care about these things, why aren't you taking action over here? Um, that's, that's incredibly powerful. Outstanding. Well, uh, we've got about five minutes left until the hour. Are you guys able to go over a little longer? Because we still have a few questions here. Yeah, I can go for a few minutes. Sure. Brian, sure. So whoever wants to stick around, if people want to stick around, we'll still try to answer some of these questions. But I, with just a little time left in the hour, I did want to get back to the the uh, main the main question that we ended with in the magazine, and that I know you, is important to you guys, which is uh, during this time, should people be mm -hmm. is there more opportunity or less opportunity for e-commerce during the during the pandemic during COVID nineteen? You want to start with that one, Brian? Sure. I'll start with that. I would say there's, there's a lot more opportunity because there's so many um, so many people buying online right now. Just the, it's like, you know, a, a million 
millions and millions of people just just entered the arena where you are. Um, so there's a huge, just a surge of new customers. And those customers, since they're buying online right now, they have, they don't their preferences aren't set in stone yet. They don't know what brands they like online. So they're just experimenting. They're dabbling. They're going around experimenting with all these little direct-to-consumer brands, with larger brands. And they're building their preferences right now. And so there's that part of the opportunity where there's just this huge market that's now come online. And the other side of it is the tools, getting back to that kind of like mentality of lots of small tools, there has never been so many amazingly easy to use tools where you don't even need an IT um, group to get going. Like Shopify, you can literally get up and running with a Shopify website in one day. We did it on, you know, we did it, we created a Shopify website just to show um, how our tool works, but we spun it up in one day. And it's, you know, it might take you longer, but I was just online and saw uh, someone just um, has a fully functioning Shopify website in two weeks, which is a literally functioning website. And then you can start, you know, there's all these tools that just plug and play um, and you can use, and a lot of them are for free. So, so one person can be up and running with an e-commerce site, you know, in a second. You just have to have that point of view and just start, start where you are with what you have. So, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing time to be online. Yeah, and I, I agree with that and add on that, you know, I think, to even as we're advocating that brands think about their consumers as people, you know, if we pause for a second and think about our own experiences over these last three months um, in our lifetimes, I think there has been so much disruption, so much instability, uncertainty, questioning, um, and through that discomfort, oh my God, we're going to see so many amazing innovators and entrepreneurs stand up. Um, so I, I think. Yes, this is a great time to start. It's always a good time to start. Um, but now I think especially that um, there's so many things being sort of exposed, whether it might be, you know, to Brian's point, millions of people online that never considered online shopping before because now they have to, um, or even, you know, now being exposed to things in our society or the way that we're organizationally set up to work or to act as a family unit or to get our supplies or to do our grocery shopping or to find out about products that we love, um, it's it's like a it's a whole new world. So while this is quite you know uncomfortable, and I think um, both with the onset of COVID and then to the, the social justice and inequality issues that we um, have been watching sort of be, get more attention, I think the right finally the right type of attention that people need to actually now commit to make action about um, it is it is a time of change. Um, that always opens a lot of doors open for people that um, are willing to put in the work and and get some great things done. So it's a great time. Um, and and two, I think I would remind folks that it is it's a step by step by step process, and it doesn't happen overnight. So if you are frustrated or you feel like you're digging through a nest of threads that might not connect, that's an okay feeling. <laughs> it kind of feels like that. <laughs> that might, you know, that that's sort of the reality of what something brand new feels like. Um, but I will guarantee that these are the platforms that your community will continue to be on, that your customers are beyond. Um, and if you're going to make a change, uh, do it now. And, and think too about, you know, perhaps you're at a larger brand that needs to go through some cultural changes to be able to accommodate this and take advantage. Um, this is a time to be innovative and to really rethink, I think, the, the historical structures that we've had, because what we had before will not serve us in the future. Absolutely. Um, well, let's look at a few of these other specific questions here real quick. I know people have some really want these to be answered. Um, someone says, I feel like our small sporting goods company has a very good human connection with our customers, and they tend to be very loyal advocates. However, we sell one very specific piece of equipment, so we can count on so we can can't count on them for repeat sales. What can we do to leverage those positive feelings? For example, testimonials, become a dealer for other products, etc. Et mm -hmm. And they, they say they also just started using hot jar and love it. Oh, good. <laughs> so that's a good question. I'll I'll take this. I'm sure there's different points of view on this, but this is where it gets back to. Um, a point of view. So another 
well-worn example is Apple. It, it serves the reason why is it because it serves as a really good example. Um, a lot of people think that, that they're in the business, like if you're in the computer business, you make computers. But Apple was in the elegant simplicity business in, in simplifying technology. And so they, they had one product, which was a computer, and they created three different computers. And then they said, okay, well, I could do this iPad, iPod. I could get into music. We could get into cars. We can get into anything. They're not a company about um, yeah. a computer. They're a company about humanizing technology and creating elegantly simple um, experiences. So the, the answer to the question, you know, we sell one product. What do you, if, once you can answer what you sell that product about and what your customers love about that product, and it's not about the transaction. It's not about the functionality of the product. There's another kind of belief system baked in there somewhere. And if you find that, you can sell lots of different products about what you're selling that one product about. Outstanding. Do you okay. have any for that one, Kelly? Or your perspective? I think that's a great answer. And in the interest of answering more questions, I 100% I agree with what Brian just said. <laughs> Next one. Uh, okay, this is a this is a good question here. Someone wants to know if an email newsletter is a must-have. They say they seem effective, but is it better just to focus on the site and social channels? Okay, can I take this one? No, <laughs> um, email, email, yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, email is an incredibly important channel. Um, so keep stay focused on email. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is think about segmentation that you might be able to do with your email. Um, one and not advocating that everybody go and switch your email provider or anything, but one of the ones that I found to be most successful for e-com clients that has come recently, the last five or six years on the scene, um, is Clavio. And that one, um, that's an email provider that I really like to use because they allow you to segment your user base by what they're actually doing on your website if they're signed up for your email. So the reason that that's important is this main thing of being human you know, if you're thinking about having like your e-com store is your retail store, people are walking through the front door and they start asking about ice picks or, you know, something very specific, you know, if they're asking about ice picks, they might need five or six other things, or they might be interested in a story that you have to tell about something that would be related to that specific product that they want. Um, so newsletter, email newsletter, very, very important. Do not ditch it. Um, and do not, and I would also say back to our point about organic audiences, those that join your email newsletter want to hear from you. So take that seriously and think about that as a direct connection to the information that you're sharing about your brand. Um, and then think about how you can continue to cultivate the people that are paying attention on your email newsletter. Um, one other tip that I will give is we tend to segment out email into a couple of different buckets. So there might be um, like, uh, you know, more traditional newsletter, like sharing storytelling emails that might go out. And another bucket might be transactional emails where you're talking about a sale or a certain product. Another email might be related to events or partners that you want to feature, maybe nonprofit that you partner with. Um, but think about the, the key here with email with other platforms is thinking about segmentation, what messages you're sending when, and what goal you have by sending out that message to this specific audience. Very, very important. There is a, a um, if you go into Quora, you can find the um, head of marketing, I believe, for Huckberry goes deeply into their philosophy on newsletters and email, and it's a really great read. I would recommend it to anybody. They do a great job with their um, with their email newsletter, um, so there's a lot to learn there. Great Good question. Time. Yeah, let's do one last uh, listener question, and then one final question from me, and we'll wrap it up. So our last uh, our last listener question here is. Why are so many brands ignoring or competing with the retailers in the online scene? For a while, it seemed that many brands were using platforms like Shopatron, where the retailers had shared in the fulfillment or is weighted to distance the customer placing the order. One of you guys want to take that one? Why are so many brands competing with retailers? So I, I think this, well, this is a challenging question because there's probably multiple points to it and I bet it changes depending right. on the brand and the 
the retailer. But I would say um, I think what we're perceiving as competition is probably, you know, in reality, more of brands moving towards where they see the customers are. Um, and until you can solve for that sort of how you think about your team, if your team is a retailer and a brand that work together and you want to move in the same direction, um, setting up a system that's mutually rewarding makes sense. And I think we're probably, I don't know that that's been figured out yet. If there's anybody in the call that has an example of that, I know um, that's a challenge in moving from, you know, the, the previous model to a future model. Um, I think the, the competition piece that comes out is that consumers' behavior are changing. And so what you're seeing there is brands trying to respond um, and then retails pro retailers also probably trying to respond as well. So that competition is generated by people trying to move towards or brands moving towards that the consumer demand, which is what we should all be organized around. Um, so I think it's just a nature of going through this transitional period. I would say my answer to that is um, I am agnostic whether it's retailers. I love my local retailers, my local running retailer. I go there all the time. I think they're wonderful. Um, I love I love buying direct, direct from brands, and I don't think, see it necessarily as a competition between them. I know that because I'm not, I don't have a dog in that fight. Um, I, I think it's more whoever, what it, where it's become with digital especially, it's about owning the relationship with the customer. Um, mm. Who can, who can be most customer centric? There are retailers who started in retail, and Evo is a good example, backcountry.com is a good example, where they started as a pure play retailer, um, but backcountry is now selling their own products. Um, but it, it's about the reason why backcountry's had such success is because they're so focused on their customer. When you go there, it feels like a specialty retailer online. You get that relationship, you can chat with people, they have programs you can go on, you know take travel trips, it really feels like an online specialty retailer. And I think anyone who can deliver that, whether you're a brand or a retailer, anyone who is hyper-focused, the most hyper-focused on the customer and providing an amazing experience for the customer is going to win. And that's a great for everybody, or at least for all customers. Standing. Well, how about one last question for me, and I think we'll get back to what we promised people with one action item someone can take right now. And uh, we'll start with you, Brian, then we'll finish up with you, Kelly. And uh, so, Brian, what is one thing someone can walk away with us right now that they can go out and do to make a difference? Uh, start blogging. Start, start telling your story. Um, <clears throat> I find so I've spent my entire life um, helping brands tell stories, helping brands find stories, all about story. The interesting thing about story isn't about getting kind of getting people interested. The best thing about telling stories is you actually find out what you think and what you believe by trying to tell other people because you don't you don't know how like telling a story helps you focus kind of helps you organize your own thinking. So most of you know I've, I've founded two companies so far and I didn't know what I was doing when I started. But the more I had to tell people about it, the more I had to pitch the companies and sell it, the more clear I understood my own companies. Um, so I would say start talking right, right now. Start blogging because you're going to figure out what you, you have something inside you and you know that kind of something that doesn't feel right, something's wrong with the world that you want to fix, but you're not sure. Start telling people about it. You do two wonderful things. You gather an audience on one hand. On the other hand, you actually understand what it is you're put on this earth for. Like it. I love Bob, that. You're up here, Gally. What's your yeah. one? So I'm going to go. I'm going to answer a lot aligned with my passion point and expertise. But it it is for me. I think it. Um, making sure that you understand what your customers' experience is in the e-com environment that you're offering them. Um, we've talked about Hotjar as a tool that will allow you to see heat maps and click maps. Um, another tool being um, there's a function in, in Google Analytics where you can look at funnels and, and if your goals are set up correctly, actually see and visualize people moving through your site. If you use Shopify, um, that's, that's, they offer an analytics view to do that as well. 
Um, but I would say the, the thing to start with is to make sure that you absolutely understand what somebody's customer journey is on the website that you've set them up to walk through. You've tried to build this perfect mouse trap, and now you've got to go check on the mice. <laughs> What's happening in there? Because you know, I think so often you build what feels like a beautiful environment, and then it's like crickets, and you're like, okay, where are the dollars? But maybe everybody's stuck at a category page, or they can't get through to see the product that you want to make sure that everybody's exposed to. So, so by far and away, um, starting with really understanding that customer journey, which on e-com, requires you diving into the analytics and understanding how people are navigating through your pages. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you both. And actually, I just want to close with, if each one of you could tell people how they can get in contact with you or take advantage of your services moving forward if they wanted to. Uh, Kelly, I guess you sure. start on that. Yeah, for sure. So we, um, I'm Kelly at welcome to prismatic.com. Um, we've got a presence on LinkedIn. So I'd love to connect with folks that were on this call if, if you want to be in touch. Um, and then our website is welcome to prismatic.com and uh, would, would love to hear from people. Yeah, you can get a hold of me at Brian at talcoot.com. It's T A L K O O T. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn, and that's where I'm posting a lot of content. Um, and www.talcoot.com as well. <laughs> www. Fantastic. Well, it was great that you guys were able to go over a little bit. We got to everyone's questions, I believe. Uh, thanks again. I hope to see more people back here too next week when I'll be talking to uh, Kristen Carpenter from Verde Brand Communications about. Uh, uh, courting the consumer and the difference between uh, institutions and creators and our creators are kind of taking over where institutions used to be the big thing. So thank you both. Okay, thank you so <laughs> That's great. You guys, you guys can send some questions next week. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well. All right. Well, take care, guys. So Bye. Bye. It was Bye. great.